My name's James Foreman um, and I lead the site here at New England. I've been here, um, I've been a member of this site for some 11, 11 and a half years and I'll tell you a bit of my story later. We've had a brilliant time in, uh, in this series, Viva La Resurrection. I don't know, I don't think, I think it is a PB to spend 12 weeks in six verses of the Bible. It's quite, um, quite it's good for us anyhow. Um, and you know, these six verses of the Bible, if you want to know what they're really about, it's really addressing what do you do when you become a Christian? How do we live? What's going to go on in our lives? And today I'm going to speak the last um, sermon from the series before our world exclusive next week, which I'm looking forward to invite your friends. But before I do, let's just rewind a bit first, because how can we really talk about what it is we do as Christians if you don't really understand what Christianity is? So, just to let you know, the greatest moment in history has already happened um, when, this, when I speak about this thing from Acts. Something's already happened. Now, what's already happened? God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Perfect, perfect man. Never did anything wrong. Never did anything sinful. Um, God sent his son, fully God, fully man, into the world to make a change. God's son lived amongst us for years. He was a carpenter, worked with his hands. Um, lived amongst us, understood how we are, understood all of our pains, understood everything that we go through, understood every one of our emotions, and he watched. He was baptized around the age of, I think, 30, 31. As he came out of the water, um, God spoke and said, this is my son, my beloved son. Jesus then went on um, to, to preach to, us, to, to the world, to tell the world what he was going to do. And the world judged him. He was crucified. He was flogged and beaten. He was not recognizable. And he was judged guilty, even though he'd done nothing wrong. He didn't say anything. He just walked up Calvary's hill and died the death that each one of us should have died. Jesus took our place on the cross. No one went with him. None of his friends went with him. He went there alone. Um, observations are that from the cross, the scripture says, you know, it is finished. And he died to take our place. For, on the third day, he rose from the dead. So there was two days when he was in the tomb. And I guess Christianity is over. On the third day, he, he rose from the dead. He restored his friends, including Peter, who denied him. He met with them, met with 120 of them, um, commissioned them, told them, blessed them, showed them what was going to happen. And he told them, you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to head off to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. So the 120 went off to Jerusalem, including Peter, his friend, who had denied him. Being, like Joel said the other week, just like, I don't know that man. Just horrendous denial of his friend. And when the Holy Spirit came like a wind on them, God the Holy Spirit, empowering them, Peter went from a total coward and he stormed out at some sort of early in the morning and preached the gospel. And 120 people turned to 3,120 people in a moment. And that's where the Christian church started. And then here we get to this part of, of scripture where it says the fellowship of the believers. And we like to call it Viva la Resurrection. So I'm just going to read Acts 2.42 through to 2.47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I'll pray. Lord, we thank you so much for um, this true story I've just explained, this true story of Jesus Christ. And I just want to pray for each one of us as I, as I preach about you, adding day by day those who are being saved. It would inspire each one of us. Lord, you would lift our heads, lift our faith in the Holy Spirit through the wonderful scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 
we've got just a bit of a backdrop. We've got these four devotions. Um, we're devoted, we talked about being devoted to prayer early on. So um, just to remind you a bit about that, um, that, you know, it, Jesus was the only natural prayer we heard um, ever to live. It's a struggle for each one of us, but we're created and made to do it, to pray. Dependence on God is healthy in prayer. It's revolutionary. When you pray, you can change the world. It should be habitual. Each one of us should be praying. Um, you know, daily, hourly, we should be seeking God in all of our lives. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to scripture, fell in love with this book, this book that will walk them through every part of their life. They were devoted to the apostles teaching it as it was then and learning from them and listening to preaching, sitting down, listening, asking God for it to shape their lives. They're devoted to fellowship. Um, you don't go to church. You are the church. Jesus, you are Jesus' people. That makes you the church. You're one new man, one new body joined together. Devoted to breaking of bread. The table's where we'll take communion later. We don't celebrate our humanity. We celebrate Jesus. We celebrate his death, his body, his blood, his resurrection. And then we talked about awe, about fearing God, signs and wonders, all things in common, selling possessions to serve people's needs, attending the temple courts, big meetings like this, uh, being in each other's homes, small meetings, in small groups, praising God, talked about worship, talked about favour. And today, we're going to talk about the Lord adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. But before I come on to the saved bit or rescued bit, I just want to let you know what you're added to. It's, we're added to the church. I'm, I'm passionate about this church. I'm passionate about it because it, the story, uh, my story um, is totally caught up in Church of Christ the King, completely. Let me tell you my story. So, as a young man, I was born in a family where um, Jesus was never spoken, um, a Bible was never opened, uh, God was never an option. Um, I used to have dreams between the ages of about five and eight, wondering where the world came to an end, kind of dreams about, you know, what is the point of life? You know, here I am as a young man, tell me there's got to be more to life than just me. Um, but the, the world that I lived in and the people I lived with, the answer was, there is nothing but you. Live for today. Don't live for anything else. There is nothing else to live for. It's a pointless activity. Um, so by the age of 10, I, had, I accepted that as, as, the, as the way I was going to live. And I lived like that for the next 14 years. Um, it, it wasn't the best way to live. So if you're in that place now, I'd, I'd, I'd appeal to you to change. But, uh, so that meant that I lived for myself. I was confident that that was the only option I had. And so that's what I did. I had some good moments and some terrible moments trusting in me and not in God. At 24, I've, I uh, met a lady who is now my wife called Alexis. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm the only one allowed to do that, really. Um, I met my wife, Alexis, uh, and we fell in love, which was a good move. And uh, over the next two to three years, uh, I, as I uh, became more and more closer with her, I realized she was a Christian. Yep, she wasn't attending church regularly, but she was definitely a Christian. There was something different about her. The, the, the experience at 10 where there's nothing more to live for than yourself, suddenly that was being shaken up by meeting someone um, who was a Christian. As we walked towards our wedding day, it was a walk, and um, I, uh, you know, I was asking questions about God because I could see there was something different in her life. On my wedding day, I stood at the front of this Anglican church in Bristol. Um, all my friends behind me, uh, university friends, other friends from my upbringing, reasonably popular guy, um, felt, you know, felt well loved. Stood at the front of this room, um, organ playing, a vicar with a dress on. No offence if you're a vicar in here, but that's what I thought as a guy who didn't know Jesus. I was like, I don't understand. He's smiling at me. And I've never, ever felt so alone. Ever. I stood there and I just thought, I can't do this. I want to get married. Um, it's not about I can't get married. It's living for myself doesn't work. I need to live for something else. I need help. So in that moment, I don't think anyone had told me to do this. In this random church, I said, God, if you're there, I'm going to find you. I need your help with my marriage. 
Alexis pops up the aisle, gives me one of those smiles, and her and her dad, who are both Christians, definitely had something in their lives that I didn't, and I knew it in that moment, and I thought, I'm going to hunt it down if it's, if it's real. So three days after we came back off our honeymoon, I sat on a table about there, the sort of over there, and joined an alpha course. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to hammer through everything that they say. I'm going to pick it apart. I'm a bright guy. And as I started to pick it apart, I started to fall in love with Jesus. On uh, the sixth week of the Alpha course, I prayed the prayer that they offered to me. I did it in cold blood. I prayed a prayer that said, I said to Jesus, I said sorry for the way I've been living my life. I repented of it. I put my trust in Jesus and said I was going to follow him. Then I opened my eyes and nothing changed. But it did really. I'm just saying like emotionally nothing changed. But my life started to change. I got the train the next day to London. I got a Bible out and everyone looked at me, what are you doing? And I thought, well, I started at the beginning, read through my, started to read my Bible. Just started to fall in love with Jesus. Things were changing in my life. Two or three weeks later, uh, I went on a uh, Holy Spirit uh, evening that we do here, similar thing. And uh, I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God changed me completely. If I had five to ten things in my life that I couldn't, control I was not in control of through you know not not that they were conquering me at that moment but I was fearful of including lying fighting being angry um, not being uh, sexually pure in my marriage I was worried about them and I wasn't confident in them and asked Jesus would you help me and he did he lifted off burdens off of me in a moment and changed my life and that is my story I was born into a church like this. This church was the one that resourced the Alpha Course. This church is the one that prayed for it. This church is the one that fed me. This church is the one that put the, the chairs out for me. This church is the one that did everything for me so that I could meet Jesus. And I'm so grateful for it. And I, I just want you to all hear that thank you if you're around at that time. And if not, we still do that for people today. And it's wonderful to be a part of. As I said earlier, you don't go to church, you are the church. God's plan A for sa reaching and saving the universe, including Brighton, is the church. God's plan B for reaching and saving the universe, including Brighton, is the church. God's plan C is the church. We are his answer. We are the people who are going to reach Brighton if you're a Christian. Let's go on to 1 Corinthians 12. Um, this is a bit of a tongue twister, but I'm sure I'll get through it. So, brace yourselves. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, I think I've seen that in Monsters, Inc. <laughs> uh, but, and sorry. Uh, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. We're all one. We all have a part to play. Each one of you is uniquely created and made. And each one of you, if you're a Christian and part of this church, because you are a Christian, you have something to bring. And you need to hear that. And we want to see you grow into everything that God has for you. You need each other. You can't do this on your own. Church is a community. You need to do it together. You need to do it with one another. I meet so many people right, over the years, especially older people, but this is a lesson for all of us, who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Why not? Well, they hurt me. Have they hurt you? Well, you know, we had a falling out. And, and do you know what I want to say? If you're in this room and that's you or you're watching this, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry where you've been hurt. I'm really sorry where you have been hurt by the church, but you're still part of the church. Um, come and talk to someone in leadership. 
Pray with us. Help us to understand. Help us to lead you. Come and be part of the church again. Now, JFK, John F. Kennedy, for those who don't know, um, in the 1960s, we had, um, we had a very exciting part of history. There he is, looking swag. Um, and uh, they are rockets. Uh, but they're like... Um, in the 1960s, they had the space race. So USSR, superpower, USA, superpower. And it was the first one to get a man into space. The USSR won that. The next race was the first country to get a man on the moon. And JFK was, uh, so it's said, to be rather concerned about this because there was so much of the US taxes being invested in this uh, race to the moon that he, you know, is a big pressure on the whole country, but it's also part of, you know, the world news. So he decided that he must go down to NASA and he must, you know, make sure that the world know he's there, his eyes are on it. So he, he goes to their headquarters and he's walking down a corridor, uh, pacing, and in front of him he can see a cleaner. And so as he walks up to the cleaner, he's obviously a cleaner, he, he says um, to the cleaner, so what do you do? And the cleaner looks at the president and says, Mr. President, and he's like, yes, he's, he says, Mr. President, I'm here to help the US, United States of America put a man on the moon. And that's the same in church. You all have a part to play, but why are we here? We're here to help people like me know that Jesus is better. People like you to know that Jesus is better and to walk through all parts of our life together. A body, if you're a bodybuilder, right? I've heard this from Arnold Schwarzenegger, so it's got to be true. <laughs> and he, he, it's a fabulous body, Toby. Um, but anyhow, it's said that when, you, when you're in good shape as a bodybuilder, if you want to put uh, an extra inch on your bicep, you have to do it all over your body. All, you know, so inch on the bicep, inch on the thighs, inch on the calves. Everything has to grow at the same amount. Otherwise, the body is out of balance. And it's the same with the church. You know, you have we have to grow together. If we want to grow this site, and if we want to grow churches around Europe, like we're doing in Amsterdam and in Berlin and elsewhere, and plant more sites, we all need to grow together. For us to muscle up, we need you to come and play your part. So I just want you to hear that. I want you to know that we want that for you. I want that for you. I want you to grow to be mighty in God. That might mean a simple task. I, I think I've done nearly, now, I've, now I'm preaching, I've done nearly every task in church apart from worship, and you don't want that. <laughs> but, like, um, but you know, every task I've tried to do with the gratitude that I had the first time Jesus walked into my life, every part I thought, you know what, whatever I do, I'm glad to play it as best I can. God did that in my heart, not me on my own, but I'm glad of it. If you're in this room and you've benched yourself and you're not serving or leading in small group or going to small group, I just want to encourage you to get off the bench, get back in the game. Come and serve with us. Come and grow with us as a church. Give you an example. Sundays. You know, actually, Sundays is like the highlight of your week if you're a Christian. This isn't your Sabbath. This is the place where you come to worship God with your best, not your rest. It's where you come and you say, Jesus, I'm going to give my all. I'm going to throw open this building to Brighton. I'm going to show it um, how wonderful you are. If it's only with my smile or my prayer, but I'm really up for this. Um, you see, we want to give our best on a Sunday. I was thinking about this. I'll just give you one example. One example would be kids' work. I heard last week, I was, uh, two weeks ago at a conference, that 80% of people... Um, who give their life to Christ, do it before they're 18 years old. And then when I meet someone in kids' work, and then you say, what are you doing? Where are you serving? Oh, I'm in kids' work. Oh. You know, someone's got to do it. And I said to them, do you know, I heard the other week that you're actually working and serving in an area of ministry where you've probably got the most chance of seeing someone come to Jesus. You go into that room with that in your mind, with that in your heart, you go and pray for those kids. You go and speak to those kids. You go and teach those kids. Go and make it excellent for them because they might meet, might meet Jesus. You know what? I'd love that sort of serving to be right across the board. Bu we're building a church in the most likely of cities. Not unlikely. 2% of Brighton, I think, go to church. Under 50% believe in God. But Jesus says in Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
When Jesus says he'll build his church, he'll build it. History says, uh, 1926 in Brighton, the Jeffries brother, uh, brothers came to Brighton. George Jeffrey was a great preacher. Um, he had, a, he had a, a ministry for preaching the gospel and seeing the sick healed. And the Jeffries brothers came to Brighton. Now that hair, by the way, <laughs> he was on mission for Brighton, wasn't he, right? I mean, <laughs> that, that, that guy is a missionary. Um, but like, uh, so he, when he came to Brighton, they, they'd, they'd, they'd had a, a, a good run at reaching cities. And so they came to Brighton in 1926, and believe me, Brighton wasn't much different to what it's like today. Um, it, Brighton's always been uh, anti-God by, you know, by its nature. And uh, so they came to the town. The papers don't write anything about it. Um, they get into a first mission hall. They start their services. People are getting healed. People are coming to Jesus. They grow to another um, hall. And they, people are getting healed. People come to Jesus. Then they go to the pavilion. People are getting healed. People come to Jesus. Then they end up going to the dome and having two meetings a day, fully packed out. People getting healed. People coming to Jesus. People dying of cancer, um, not having cancer anymore. People in wheelchairs for 14 years, getting up and walking across stages. God was doing remarkable things in Brighton in 1926. On the last night um, that they preached down here, 260 people stood up and, got ba- and went and got baptised um, from that one meeting. On that last meeting, they also, um, the crowd came together and they bought a building, which is the Font and Firkin in town, before it was a, a wonderful preaching uh, building, um, Will- uh, William Vivian building it was called. They bought that building, so they left the legacy of a church in Brighton in 1926. When you read these sort of stories, you get rather excited and really like, wow, what has God done then? But let me bring you to Brighton now. Let me bring you to New England. Got some numbers up here. So in 2000, these are our new members here at the New England site. In 2013, we had 32 new members, 2014, 40, 2015, 50. And then last year, we had 104 new members. And then this year, I've put at the bottom, I hope to break for 120. That's remarkable. Have you seen what God's doing in people's lives? The stories that I hear, they're remarkable. We're not far off, guys. God doing something great. I want to tell you about three people's stories. This emptiness that I talked about um, before I met Jesus. Um, there's three people I, I was just thinking about. I've, a dear friend of mine, David, who got baptised last week. He got to a point in his life where he was just so um, down about the way that he sinned and let himself down that he was going to kill himself. And he was going to throw himself off a balcony. And he, said to, and he just said, God, can you help me? And as he, as he was about to commit suicide, he heard God say, my grace is enough. And then from that moment, he started to walk back into church. He's been around us. We had the privilege of baptizing him last weekend. Another friend of mine, Marina, she didn't know God, but she was sharing a student house with someone from this site. And um, they, they were in the same house for one month. And because she was in the house of a Christian who she saw doing small group, she just saw something different about them. She went on her own journey after that. But she couldn't stop thinking about this Christian. As her life got more and more troublesome and more and more difficult, she kept thinking about this girl that she'd met. So she found her on Facebook, hooked up with her and said, I need to come to your church. She came to our, uh, this church. She gave her life to Jesus. We had the privilege of baptizing, and I had the privilege of doing her membership interviews a month ago. It was stunning. It was stunning. And where did it happen? It happened because she heard some people were doing a small group in, in the house that she lived in. And one other guy, a um, f- friend of mine, Connor, got baptized last week. Um, I, I was praying for him. I met him um, uh, in, in the middle of Brighton just got on this blessing of praying for people and listening to them and eating with them and serving with them and sharing my story. And that story ended up um, with him. As he said it last week from here, I had anxieties in my heart and I just prayed out to God in the night and he freed me of them. And I knew that God was real. Gave his life to Jesus in my front room and we baptised him last weekend. These are stories of what God's doing in Brighton today. And this is the mission, the adventure that we're on. It's really exciting. I often think that we forget to ask what God could do. Get a bit worn down with your own circumstances. Get run down by, you know, what's happening in life. 
Psalm 126 helps us with this. Um, it says this, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. NLT says it like this, When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. This psalm talks about people who are in exile. Um, the, the Israelites weren't in their own country. They're in exile in Babylon. And then when they came back to Jerusalem, it was such a remarkable moment because they didn't imagine it would happen. It's like a dream. I can't believe what God has done. And uh, when I was reading a book, Circle Maker, by Mark Batterson, he brought this scripture to my attention. I just want to say to you all, just keep dreaming. He says this, As we age, yeah, I'm older than you, a bit grey, so most of you anyhow, but um, as we age, either our imagination overtakes memory, or memory overtakes imagination. Prayer and imagination are directly proportional. The more you pray, the bigger your imagination becomes because the Holy Spirit enlarges it with God-sized dreams. The older you are in God as well, the more faith you should have because you've more experienced more of God's faithfulness. I'm going to say that again. The older you are, the more faith you should have because you've experienced more of God's faithfulness to you. And it's God's faithfulness that increases our faith and enlarges our dreams. What are your dreams in God for Brighton, for your friends, for yourselves? What are they? Do you have any? Do you really have any? Do you live with a dream? Do you live serving, thinking, what I'm going to do could change the world? Do you dream about salvation in Brighton? Do you dream about those dome moments that could happen? They really could. I just want you to dream. Each one of you, I want you to have big God-sized light dreams. Because he wants them. Scripture says that, you know what, it's God that does the growth. Paul says, I planted, so I'm sowing seed in the ground, Apollos watered, but it's God that brings the growth. It's God that brings growth in our lives. But the, the war, sowing and watering, I think that's bless. If you haven't heard of bless, it, we had a whole series on it and we talk about it every week. A bless is an acronym we use to help you um, keep on page when it comes to serving others with the gospel. We begin with prayer. Praying for people, praying for them, praying for people you have faith for. Um, the Connor, the guy I talked about earlier, I prayed for him every day after I met him. Listening to them. You can't bless someone just by going in with what your opinion is. You need to know where they're at. You need to serve their lives. You need to serve them. You need to listen to where they're at. Eat with them. Jesus came, drinking and eating. Hooray, Brighton. That's a good thing. Um, but you need to eat with people. Spend time with them. Love them. Be around them. You need to serve with them and serve them. How can I help you? How can I look after you? And such. Serve people and then share your story. I shared a bit of my story earlier. But share what God's doing in your life. Pe Honestly, it's amazing. When I hear stories of what God is doing in people's lives, it's incredible. So why not get into bless? Maybe you need to start an, a small group. Today's the day where um, we need you to come forward and say, do you know what, I want to start a small group this term. I want to play my part in that way. I want to really bless people through doing small group. So today's the day. Get involved with it. You know, write up your small group, speak to your zone leader, speak to your small group leader, get involved there. I was also came to my attention, there's 100 members in this site that aren't, weren't involved in small group last term. I just want to encourage you, get back in the game, get back into community, get around people, start your journey. 
Membership is something that people sometimes get prickly about, but I think if you read through the New Testament, the Old Testament, God seems very interested in people, and the New Testament seems really interested in them too. And Paul seems to write these letters and talk about random people in houses everywhere, and, and you see all of this stuff, and you think, what has that got to do with anything? It has everything to do with it. The church is a place where you identify yourself. You, you come into community. You say, hey, here I am. My name's, for me, it's my name is James, and I'm identifying myself with you. Can we walk together? Let's see what God will do. Psalm 68.6 says that God sets the lonely in families. The church is a body and a family, and we want everyone to be raised up to be all that God called them to be. Committing yourself to the authority, discipleship, rebuke, um, coming into training, it's a big deal for Brightonians. It's like, what on earth are you doing? Man, it does you good. I've had all of them on my journey and it saved me a lot of trouble and also shaped where I'm at today and it will shape me every other day. It's a joining of heart, mind and resource coming into membership. But let me tell you a bit about behind the scenes. You know, I know people who've been members here. I know people I've prayed with, prayed for, way before having a leadership role and, and you know, seeing their children healed. I've seen people where you know, we've walked through some stuff together and they've really helped me. And then suddenly I don't see them anymore. And then I sort of see them in the street a few weeks later or a few months later. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, fine, fine. Uh, I'm seeing you at church lately. Yeah, no, I don't, no. And it's like, where have you been? I, yeah, um, yeah, I'm not going there anymore. Why not? I thought we were really close. I thought we had something going on. I thought, you know, we were church together. We shared some stuff. Yeah. I didn't like the way they did that. What? I, I didn't like it. And it, you sort of sit there and think, I don't get it. Like, I've been born into a, birthed into a church. Like, I've been birthed into a community. But it was, nope, can't go in that room. And that's what happens. There's rooms in our hearts we don't want God to, to go in. So then we run away from church. Now my encouragement, if you benched yourself or you're thinking, gosh, I'm nearly out of this church because of discipleship or because I don't really want to talk about some of the stif- stuff we're hearing in preaching, just humble yourself. Trust yourself to others. Let God do wonderful work in your heart. This church loves you. People love you. Being in community together is the best place for you to be. If you're holding back from membership because you've been hurt in another church, I'd encourage you to not do that. I'd encourage you to say, do you know what? I'm hearing what you're saying and I want to identify myself. My past pains I can walk through, we can pray through. Identify yourself with here. Come and bring all of your gifts and all of your assets, everything that you have to us and let's grow together. There's 260 people last last term in small group who aren't members. 260. Let's get, we could get that list up even more. Now, baptisms. I think we've all had some fun in the last few uh, months. Lots of people here, small groups have led people um, through the baptism course. We've had 52 people baptised in 2016. It's absolutely fantastic. Wonderful to see people birthed into local church, birthed into community. Their stories are just um, breathtaking at times, and it's just a real privilege to see it happen. Jesus, if you didn't know, um, he was baptised. And, that, you know, we're following him when we, get, when we come out of the water. We're following Jesus into new life. We're trusting in him. Scripture says that um, the angels applaud um, when someone gives their life to Jesus. It says this in, in Luke 15. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I remember, just as an example of how, you know, what that might feel like. In 1992, I was sitting um, on a summer's day. I was 16. I know you think, gosh, I thought you were younger than that. But I was 16. I'd been given a can of Fosters by my granddad. And I was sitting with my dad, my granddad, my uncles, and we're watching the telly. On the telly, we've got the 100 metres final, Olympics, uh, Barcelona, and we've got Linford Christie on the start line. Linford Christie came fourth in the 1988 Olympics. Worst place to ever come. But this is the, the, the 1992 Olympics. He's 32. Um, he's in with a chance of winning. And I'm sitting in front of the telly. The atmosphere's there. Christie's got the stare on and the swag on. He used to be quite intimidating. Next to him is his main challenger, Leroy Burrell. He's on the start line. He's sweating like a crazy lunatic. And Christie's on it. The start line happens and he gets down. And the gun fires. <laughs> And then up he gets, and then the gun fires again, and it's a false start. Back to the start line again. And my granddad's sitting there, quite tense, no one's talking. The gun fires, 
50 meters, Linford Christie's a notoriously slower starter than others. Gun fires, but by 50 meters, he's up level. And by 65 meters, he's hit the front. And 70 meters, you know he's going to win. You know those reliable commentators suddenly go, and Christie, you know, and you trust them because they are the commentator you know the voice of. He's won the gold medal and a smile came across his face. And you know what, it was just an incredible moment for our country in terms of, I remember where I was when Linford Christie won the 100 meter gold medal, but it was an incredible moment for our country. It's not often that it happens. Usain Bolt's dominated since, but it was just so exciting. And I liken that to when I see someone come out of the baptism pool, Christus Victor. You hear their story and you're saying, to, you're saying I'm in Christ. Death's not going to hold me anymore. It's wonderful moments. Wonderful, wonderful moments. Romans 6 says that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here's my thing. If you're in this room and you've got questions about baptism, we'd love to walk through them. If you've got some fights or wrestles with it, maybe you were christened as a child or you just, you know, you've got some things that really frustrate you in this area, come and talk to us. We're here to serve you. We're here to walk with you. We're here to love you. Now, 247 says the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Salvation. Honestly, I don't know sometimes when it happens for people. I remember when it happened for me. But it's different for different people. But what I want to say is, like I said earlier, we can sow, we can water, but it's God that brings forth growth. It's God that saves people. Jesus is the one that saves people. Sometimes I would say, that. sometimes I'd say, that the most remarkable thing I see is when someone's face changes after they've met Jesus. They just lighten up and brighten up. It's just the whole person changes. Ah, oh, I've been set free. Maybe that's your day today. One of the things that gets in the way, I think, is pride. I don't need saving. I don't need Jesus. That's my experience of many people I know, strong people. I don't need Christ. I don't need a saviour. And the same people, when I go to a funeral with them, they look broken. Their hearts look destroyed. They don't know where to look. They don't have any hope. They bury someone who they don't know whether they're going to heaven or not, and they're in agony. They dull the pain with alcohol. They dull the pain with um, just ignoring or anger or walking away, and their grief has no place to go. And it breaks my heart. And I just I often think about those guys and I just often say to them, <coughs> Christianity gives you a hope that gets through the grave. Christianity, what Jesus won on the cross. You know, when I'm buried, maybe in this church, what I leave behind, I leave my family behind and I know that they're, they're kept by the church and I know that my family would know, I hope to see him again. I hope to see him in eternity as he's meant to be. Revelation 21 says this. This is about heaven. This is about how it's going to be. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no longer. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. If you're in this room and you've got that emptiness inside that I talked about, my encouragement for you would be to exchange it for hope in Jesus. Exchange it for hope in God. Ask Jesus to be your saviour. And for the rest of us, I'm going to read this. I quoted it as if it was from Keller this morning, but it's not, it's from Hybels. So, uh, but I'm sure Keller would have taken it. It's about the church. There is nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. It confronts the grieving and heals the broken in the context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and offers truth to the confused. It provides resources for those in need and opens its arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addictions, frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of this world. 
Whatever the capacity for human suffering, the church has a greater capacity for healing and wholeness. Since to this day, the potential of the local church is almost more than I can grasp. No other organisation on the earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. If you're serving here, bossing it in small group, blessing people, keep going. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, take a step to him. If you're in this room and you've benched yourself, I'm not serving, I'm not going to small group, come off the bench. Come and be part of this community. If baptism's your thing, step into the baptism pool. If you're not identified as a member, step into membership. If you're not leading and you've got leadership, which I know most of you have, step into leadership. Step into the everlasting arms of Jesus.